is an eight iron and it's a dead shank. Wow. Way right. Oh, Take that shank. Hop off the puzzle. You gotta be kidding me. Very tough pitch shot right here. You gotta hit it into the hill. One hop up and bite and it's in. Kind of like that. Hey everybody, this is Jay from Sub70. I hope the weather is better wherever you are than where I currently am. This past weekend we had temperatures in the 40s, uh, 50 mile an hour wind gusts, rain, sleet, snow, uh, just absolutely disgusting weather for anyone that's interested in golfing. I've gotten in some rounds this year in the wet, cold, just terrible conditions, and I am very, very excited and looking forward to the hot, dry part of the summer. Uh, I may have a different opinion on that in late August, but for the time being, I cannot wait until there's some sunshine and heat in Chicago um, so I can get out there and play some golf myself. But the interview on this episode of the podcast is with Troy Merritt. Uh, Troy was the winner of the 2015 Quicken Loans National Tournament. Uh, he's been on the tour for quite a while and has had some great success. Um, he joined Jason and spoke about the start to his 2018 season, uh, making a lot of cuts. Uh, he even spoke about you know some adjustments or things he wants to do to accomplish more on the weekends. He spoke about the uh, Zurich Classic, where hopefully he will be teaming up with Robert Streb. If you guys didn't hear, the Zurich announced this week that they will allow walk-up music for the teams. Uh, so basically on the first tee, they will be able to select music that will be played as they get ready to uh, start their round. I think it's awesome that the Zurich is sort of embracing this kind of different format different attitude towards the event. Um, I think it's necessary. I think the monotony and kind of just standard stroke play event that's been the classic PGA Tour, you know, model, um, you know, it's worth having a couple events in there that kind of flip it on its head and, and give the, the players um, and the fans, you know, some something different to look at and, and to, to watch. Troy also spoke about uh, growing up in su southern Idaho and Iowa, uh, where he has a lot of family, growing up and, and his path to becoming a professional golfer, um, especially from those areas and not necessarily having a ton of, um, you know, marketing or hype surrounding him, you know, coming out of high school and things like that. Uh, he talked about winning the Quicken Loans, uh, which was Tiger Woods tournament at the time. Uh, there's some other cool topics in there. You know, he even mentions that he is a fan of watching golf, but he finds himself watching more European tour events or even LPGA events uh, because he likes watching players and courses that he doesn't normally get to see. Um, you know, he's been out on the tour long enough that he knows all the courses on the PGA tour. He knows all the guys, and he gets more enjoyment and satisfaction out of watching. Um, you know, new courses and new players and different shots that are that need to be hit and things like that. So uh, it's a really awesome interview. Uh, we definitely appreciate the time. Check out Troy Merritt on social media. Here is the interview. Well, I would like to welcome to the Sub 70 podcast PGA Tour winner, Troy Merritt. Troy, thank you very much for taking the time today. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me on. So how would you assess your 2018 so far? And as we're getting into the sort of spring season, post-masters, what are you working on with your game and where do you sort of see it going? Yeah, it's, you know, I was having this conversation with my wife recently. As far as uh, the most consistent and balanced I've had to start a year, it's been this year. Uh, there hasn't been any glaring issues with anything in my golf game. You know, week in, week out, I, pre I feel really confident with what I have to offer that week. And as a result, I mean, I've, I've made eight of 14 cuts, which, you know, you, you think that's that's not great. But as far as my career goes, you know, I'm about a 40% made cut guy. So I'm way above my, my average. And it's just, it's just been real consistent. The only problem is I just haven't really had the high finishes. You know, I've struggled on the weekend. And with the exception of the top 10 at uh, the AT&T Pebble Beach, I really haven't finished inside the top 35 come Sunday evening. And 
and that's the next goal. You know, I need to I need to do better on the weekends and and uh, and continue making birdies and being consistent and, and climbing the leaderboard instead of just kind of filtering my way to the back. And you know, coming into the spring season here now, you know, I feel rejuvenated after having well, it'll be two weeks off by the time I go to San Antonio next week. But even a week and a half off, my body feels good. And you know, I get that itch to go and play tournament golf again. And I'm really looking forward to it. And, and the things that I'm most working on to, to uh, achieve that consistency is, is coming straight from short game and putting. My short game stats this year have been uh, very subpar. My, my ball striking's kept me in a lot of weeks. And my putter's been a little inconsistent. And, and that's the best part of my game is is making putts and at least making a score. And uh, it just hasn't been there. So hopefully we can get everything to click and have a pretty good run here come the spring. You know, and it's not, you're, you're a tour veteran, you've been out there a long time. Is there something that's, that's, is it a different pressure over the weekend or you just get impatient a little bit? Because obviously if you make the cut, you're beating half the best players in the world. So you're you're playing well. What's that next step to kind of get, you know, a few more birdies and a little bit more consistent over the weekends? Is it, you know, you've been there, you've won, you've done this before. Is what are you sort of seen to kind of, for lack of a better word, up the leaderboard a little bit more? Yeah, you know, I think, and and it's actually, you know, it, it can be kind of tough to, to go about it this way, but it's how you have to go about it. And when I've been successful, it's how I've gone about it. It's, you know, don't let the uh, the golf course come to you necessarily. That's kind of how I open my rounds on Thursdays. You know, kind of let the golf course come to you, get off to a good start, make some nice stress-free pars, have some good look at birdies, try to get a couple to roll in, but don't, you know, really do anything to, you know, get off to a bad start, make a few bogeys or, you know, have some issues. And, and Saturday needs to be more, you know, I feel about, getting after the golf course, go out and, and make something happen. Give yourself great looks at birdies, play aggressively and, and move up that leaderboard. And, you know, and like I said, the problem with, with, with that philosophy for me right now is that my short game hasn't been very good. So if you're going to have that real aggressive approach, you're not always going to hit it next to the pin. You're going to miss some shots short sided in some tough places and you have to be able to get the ball up and down to keep that momentum going. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to do that. So I've then had to play a little more conservative. And there go your good birdie looks. And, you know, it's it's tough to make five, six, seven birdies when you're putting from 25, 30 feet for birdie all day. So that's why, the, you know, the key here, going in the spring for me, is to, is to refocus the short game and the putting so we can take that more aggressive approach uh, into the weekend. Is there any golf courses over the next, say, four to six weeks that you're really comfortable on, fits your eye well, that you, you think you're going to have some really good results, anything that you really – like on this upcoming stretch? Uh, there is. Uh, next week down in San Antonio, it, it's a tough golf course. It's a ball strikers golf course, and uh, and the greens are tricky, and it doesn't take 20 under par to win, which I absolutely love. Uh, so if you can go down there and manage your game, manage the wind, make a lot of pars, throw in two, three, four birdies around, you know, and shoot two, three under par every day, you're going to be right there at the top of the leaderboard. If you get to 10 under, you've got a great chance of winning the golf tournament and at worst finishing in the top five. And I really like that about San Antonio. And I haven't had any high finishes there, but I usually make the cut there. I mean, I think I've only missed the cut maybe once or twice out of six go around set or five or six go around set golf course. So I, I like next week and then uh, Zurich Classic after that, the team event. Uh, my rookie year when it was just, uh, you know, individual stroke play, I finished third there. And uh, I, I feel very comfortable on that golf course. It, it's not too challenging tee to green. Um, there are times throughout the last few years where I've struggled uh, reading those greens, but um, you know, with, with the team event, it's it's nice to have uh, your partner in your back pocket. And and uh, Robert Streb and I actually played pretty solid last year. We found ourselves in the second to last group come Saturday. We just struggled a bit on the weekend. Really, we stopped making birdies, and and you can't do that in a team event, especially on Sunday when it's best ball and guys are shooting, you know, thirteen, fourteen under par. So I'm looking forward to the next few weeks. Did uh, I heard there's um, theme music for the uh, partnership coming out for the Zurich event? Did you and Robert figure out what song you guys are going to come out to yet? We haven't yet. I mean, we need to uh, figure out first and foremost when uh, when Streb's uh, little baby boy is going to make an appearance. <laughs> He's his his wife is is very pregnant and is due here uh, over the next week or two, and and that's going to determine whether or not he can play the game. If you know if she. Um, or if he comes a little bit late, you know, into that week of Zurich, you know, he's going to stay home. So I've got to, um, you know, maybe find somebody else come that time. But uh, until then, we're going to plan on this as if we're both going to be playing together. 
Um, I don't, we're not sure if we're going to go kind of more of a hype song, you know, kind of get everything going, or if, you know, we're going to kind of soft and mellow, you know, like a Somewhere Over the Rainbow kind of song. <laughs> Air Supply song or something like that. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. Right. So a nice little something love song or something. Yeah, something to put our competitors to sleep so we can blow right by them. Uh, I like Streb as a partner. I mean, when he gets it going, man, he can he can run off some birdies. That'd be like a perfect combination. I I think you guys could play really well there. And he's like, like you said, you're pretty consistent. And you look at his game. When he really gets it on with that putter and his iron game, he's – he can put some birdies up there. Absolutely. And, you know, it was about this time last year, neither one of us was playing real well. Um, again, this year, you know, uh, he hasn't been playing very well, unfortunately. And, you know, I've been playing all right, but just haven't had the finishes. And this week kind of changed. It definitely changed uh, his season last year. He went on to have some good finishes. He finished second uh, later in the summer at the Greenbrier and, and really, uh, you know, short up his year. Um, so, it, you know, hopefully it works out for us to play again uh, this year. You know, Streb predominantly hits a right-to-left shot, and I like to work the ball left to right off the tee. So we have that complementing uh, each other. We can work that into our favor around the golf course. And, uh, and like you said, I mean, last year my iron game was pretty solid for us, and he rolled in some good birdie putts. So the alternate shot, at least on Thursday, that's why we found ourselves near the top of the leaderboard. We, uh, we played really solid together, and, and we both found a lot of birdies on Friday. And, uh, yeah, I mean, plus, not to mention, he, he's a veteran out there, and he's a lot of fun. He's a great guy. He's got a great caddy, and we just really enjoy ourselves on the golf course. When you start a new season on the PGA Tour, which essentially starts in the fall of that previous year, do you, do you set yourself goals for that year, or do you kind of break it up in segments of, you know, this upcoming stretch, I want to accomplish this? Or is there goals that you're putting through for that entire season right from the start? Uh, setting goals... Um, and myself, um, kind of a love-hate relationship. And, and what I mean by that is my goal every year is to get a victory. And I think that's everybody's goal on the PGA Tour. It's just it's really, really hard to do with how good everybody is on the PGA Tour now. And, and when I say love-hate, it's you can set some pretty lofty goals. And, you know, let's say you have a really solid season. Let's say you have, you know, 12 top tens, you have six top fives, you have two runner up finishes, but you didn't win. So you didn't achieve that goal, but you still had a great year. So do you count the season as a failure because you didn't win? Or was it a good year because you had a lot of great finishes? Um, that's why I don't try to get wrapped up too much in the goals. I try to keep it more as, you know, let's let's go out and focus on and winning the golf tournament this week. And, uh, and and let's just leave it at that. And then, you know, in the practice rounds, it's, okay, how are we going to achieve that goal this week? What do we need to work on? Uh, is it stuff that we need to work on, you know, on the course? Is it stuff we need to work on on the driving range? You know, um, so it, it's, it's, it's an ongoing process. I like to just kind of take things as they come with the ultimate goal of winning every year on the PGA Tour. What new equipment do you have in the bag for the 2018 season? And how's it working for you? What changes have you made? <laughs> Funny you ask that question. I, uh, I've got the same uh, Wilson driver that I did uh, last year. Uh, it's, it's the best driver I've ever had, the D300. And uh, I've gained, I was looking at my stats uh, the other day, and I've gained over 10 yards off the tee over the, uh, from the last couple of years, which has been a huge improvement for me. And I've got the accuracy back to where it's been throughout my career. So that's, that's a good combination for me. So that stayed in the bag. Um, I actually have a uh, the new Callaway Rogue three wood in the bag, which I which I really enjoy. And uh, my irons, I've actually played the same set of irons pretty much since the fall of 2014. Uh, the Wilson uh, um, FG tours, the fours, and uh, you know I might be working in a new set maybe uh, later this year, uh, as Duffy kindly let me know that they are going to stop manufacturing that iron. <laughs> So I've got to start looking for something else. Uh, I did have him uh, build me a new uh, kind of strong four iron. Um, each week I go into a tournament with 15 clubs in my bag and then obviously have to take one out to, to meet uh, the standards and, and the rules. So I either have to take out my two iron, my three iron, or my 50-degree wedge. And I had him build me a strong four iron so I can take out my four iron and my three iron and have something that you know kind of goes right in between there as far as yardage goes, so I don't have to take out a club. So I'm looking forward to testing that out and, and seeing if I can get the right results, the ones that I'm looking for, and uh, looking forward to hopefully putting that in the bag uh, come next week in, in San Antonio. 
And why I kind of laughed um, earlier, I when I went down to Pebble Beach, I got there, um, got to the, the parking lot on Monday, took my clubs out, was getting ready to go play my practice round, and realized that I had forgot my putter in my boys' golf bag back home in Boise in the garage. Now, I had my backup putter with me, which I used all last summer, um, and had a top 10 finish on it. Uh, that week I was planning, uh, the week of Pebble Beach, I was planning on tweaking some things with my approach to putting. So I thought, you know, might as well just tweak everything. And, and, uh, and I put that putter into play and it produced another top 10 finish. <laughs> so it was kind of an accident. I switched back to that putter, but it worked out and it's, and it's still, uh, it's still my gamer right now. Any golf ball changes for this year? Uh, nope. I still play the, uh, the 17 pro V. Um, I really, I really like the golf ball. Uh, and uh, I, I don't really plan on switching anytime soon. And uh, for those who are listening, Duffy is the Wilson tour rep that both Troy and I know. He's a great guy. So when, when Troy needs something done, I'm sure he goes to Duffy and he takes care of all your equipment needs when you guys are out on tour. So great yeah, guy, Duffy's by the way. Great. He, yeah, he gets, he gets on it right away. He's got you stuff within the next day or two, you know, from Chicago to Boise. I mean, that's, that's pretty good to get something built into you basically the next day if you need it. Well, let's talk about how you started playing the game. Who introduced you to it, and kind of at what age did you fall in love with it and for that to be your kind of number one sport that you played? Yeah, so I, I grew up in the middle of nowhere, southern Idaho, in, in a small farming community. It had a little municipal golf course on the river, about 6,200 yards from the tips, nothing special. But a junior membership for the year was $75. And uh, my dad and, and my mom were both school teachers growing up, so my dad had summers off and and he played basketball and baseball throughout college. And uh, he just started picking up golf when he moved to Idaho and, and was really starting to enjoy it. And he let me tag along, you know, when I was two, three years old. And, you know, of course, wasn't overly busy. You know, they let, you know, little guys like me out there to have fun. And, and I just slowly really enjoyed the game and kept playing and kept playing. And now I played all the other sports, too, growing up. I was a, a pretty good little baseball player. And, and I played basketball throughout high school. I ended up being All-State in Minnesota my senior year. But a, uh, a six-foot skinny white guy with limited athletic ability doesn't have a, a tremendous uh, future in the game of basketball. So I, I, I stuck with the golf, and, and, I'm, and I'm really glad I did. I mean, it, it is a great game. It's a game that can never be mastered. It seems like you're solving a different puzzle every day, which I really enjoy. And, uh, and not to mention, you only have to walk you know, when you play. You don't have to run around. You don't have to be physical. You don't have to get your teeth bashed in. You get to walk around, whack a little white golf ball, get really frustrated but enjoy it at the same time and and a lot of people you know that come out and watch really appreciate uh, the way we play the game you know obviously it's, it's a different level than than most of the, uh in this world uh are able to play and and uh, and i i just i really enjoy it you know and it, it's something that i can do for years and years to come you know assuming my body stays intact and healthy and, uh, yeah, it, it's just, it, it offers something that, uh, that everybody can play, you know, at any level and, and not every sport, uh, can say that. When did you know you were good enough to go play D1 college golf? And I know you went to Winona state in Minnesota for a couple of years, and then you wound up at Boise state for the last portion of your college career. So how did all that come about? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was always a dream of mine, you know, ever since I was a little kid to play on the PGA tour, but. Growing up in southern Idaho and then going to high school in, in Minneapolis aren't exactly the golf meccas of this world. Even though there's a lot of great golf fans and golf courses in the state of Minnesota, the, the season just isn't conducive for pr producing a lot of professional athletes or professional golfers. And, uh, you know, it was kind of uh, just by chance that I ended up transferring from Winona State to Boise State. I came out to work with my uncle as a, as a cart boy at a country club in Boise here. And uh, played some junior golf or junior golf, some amateur golf events uh, that summer, and and won quite a few. And uh, you know, caught the attention of the golf coach at Boise State, who uh, played on tour for a year, played the Nike Tour for several years, the Australian Tour. Great guy, and uh, he uh, expressed interest in maybe me coming to Boise State, and and I happened to transfer at the beginning of August, right before school. It just it wasn't the plan when I came out to Boise. It just happened that way. You know, making that jump from. Division two to Division one uh, was an exciting uh, prospect, and and uh, you know even even my junior year I had two wins. Uh, I was all uh, whack uh, conference player, um, but I, I mean I didn't have the game to to turn professional. Then I don't know something clicked my senior year. 
I won seven events out of 13. I, I set an NCAA record with five wins in a row in the spring. And during that spring season was the first time that I seriously thought that, you know what, maybe I can be a, a professional golfer. You know, maybe I can test the water and, and see how it goes. And, and I told my parents and they weren't overly thrilled about it because I still had another year of school left. And, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to try the pro thing out. If it doesn't work out, I'll go back to school and I'll, I'll finish my degree and, and, pursue, and pursue something else. But uh, it's been 10 years now, and knock on wood, I'm still going strong, and uh, hopefully it doesn't change. On a sidebar, were you at Boise State when they played Oklahoma in that football game? That happened to be my junior year. That was my first year that I was at Boise State. And to be uh, quite honest, it was the first time I ever followed Boise State uh, football. I've always been an Iowa Hawkeye fan, having been born in Iowa and having most of my family in Iowa. And, and the Hawkeyes are just, you know, the best college sports team there is in this country. <laughs> that football game, though, was the greatest football game I think I have ever seen. I mean, yeah. the end of that game. So I, if you were on campus from that one and knew the other athletes, that had to be absolutely incredible to actually – Yeah. See you guys go in there and win that uh, game. Yeah, I happened to be uh, uh, at my parents' house in Minneapolis during the game, so I didn't get. I wasn't back, you know, for two more weeks uh, for the the uh, second semester. So yeah, I wasn't around for it, but we watched it, and yeah, like you said, unbelievable how that thing uh, transpired. So, so when you did turn pro, did you stay in Boise, or was there some thoughts of going to Arizona or going to Florida, where the weather is you know warmer year round, like a lot of the young professionals do, to kind of get your start on it? Yeah, uh, you know, I hung around in Boise uh, for a year. Uh, I played a couple of Canadian Tour events that summer, uh, played the Boise Open in the fall, did some Monday qualifiers, uh, was unsuccessful throughout that summer, and then uh, went to Q School uh, in the fall and uh, got my uh, nationwide card. Had, uh, well, I call it super conditional status, so I was a nationwide member, but my status wasn't good enough to get in any tournaments. And uh, by the time I did later in the spring, you know, I, I made a cut. I moved up in the in the reshuffle, which got me a few more starts. I ended up playing 17 events that year. And and uh, that summer, it would have been the summer of 09, um, you know, my, uh, my wife, who was my fiancé at the time, I told her, I said, you know what, you know, I want to pursue this golf thing, and I don't think Boise is, is quite the right place for that, and I'm, I'm going to need to move down to Arizona. And she said, all right, let's do it. So we moved down uh, July 1st. It was 120 degrees in Phoenix. And uh, I left her there in a in a 600-square-foot apartment with no friends or family, and I went on the road for eight weeks. Uh, she had a, you know, she got a job as a nanny, and, you know, we made it work for a while. And then after three years down there, we started a family, and I was on the PGA Tour, and, you know, we just decided that, you know, we didn't have any friends, family uh, down in Arizona. We didn't really like it down there. And I played more golf in Boise in the wintertime than I did in Phoenix. So it it wasn't the place that uh, that I needed to be. So we moved back to Boise, and, and it's been uh, it's been great ever since. So you can practice year-round, or do you have to take a few trips out of there in the wintertime when you're getting ready to kind of get back at it to go to Arizona or somewhere warmer to get some practice in? Yeah, t- you know, typically in Boise, they don't ever shut the courses down uh, officially. We're high desert. Uh, we average about 10 inches of snow every winter. You know, it's pretty spread out. We just don't get any big snow events. Uh, now, the winter of uh, 17 or 16 going into 17 was the second worst on record, and you weren't playing golf from December 3rd till about the end of March. Um, so that was that was a, a little bit odd. But even if it gets cold in December, the guy that I work with lives down in Phoenix, um, and it's it's easy for me to get an early morning flight and then uh, work the rest of, uh, the rest of that day, work the day after that, and then fly home the night after. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll make three, you know, maybe four trips between uh, December 1st and uh, the Sony Open, which is usually the second week of January, just to stay fresh, and then I'll play a little bit in Boise during that time as well. But, the, you know, it's a time for me to kind of recharge my batteries, a little bit of golf here or there, but to enjoy family time, you know, being on the road for 30 weeks out of the year with, a wife and two boys that don't travel. I cherish that time at home. And when I'm home, I prefer to be home. Uh, so, you know, that, that's kind of what, more what I'm looking forward to in November and December. And you kind of brought this up already, but when I was doing the my notes here for the interview, in, in 09, I saw that you played the 17 events on, I'll just call it the web.com tour, even though it's nationwide there. 
What did that tour do for your game? Then by the time you got your card to get out there in 2010, did you feel like you were pretty darn prepared to play against the best in the world? You know, I, I think the biggest thing that I learned, uh, and, it, and I learned it uh, in the summer of 08, right after I turned professional and then into the fall when I started traveling, uh, when you play in high school and college, you play as a team, you travel as a team, you always have other guys around you. Uh, when you turn professional, especially when you first start out, you know, for me, I was all by myself. I had to learn how to travel by myself, how to be by myself. I had to go to dinner by myself to do everything by myself. And, you know, it was really lonely. I actually you know, caught myself several times that first few months of traveling uh, where I would answer the TV or I would literally talk to the wall just to say some words. <laughs> so th- I think that was the biggest thing about those first few months and then the nationwide tour was you learn how to travel, how to get through airports, you know, how to deal with staying in hotels, how to eat out all the time. Um, You know, and and as far as that goes, that got me ready for the PJ tour. Um, When it comes to tournament golf. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're playing against guys that are, you know, playing for a living, you know, it's real cutthroat out there. They all want to do their very best because They've got families to support. You know, you, you can't make any money on the web.com tour. You're just hoping to break even, even if you have a good year. The ultimate goal is to get to the PGA Tour. So you're playing against some pretty desperate guys, and they, obviously they can all play the game of golf. And, uh, you know, that's that's where I learned how to compete. I mean, I had a win that year. I had a couple other top 25 finishes. But, you know, as far as the golf courses go, they're different from the web.com to the PGA Tour. Uh, you know, they're not as long. You know, the rough isn't as high. The fairways are wider. The greens are softer. It always seems to rain on Friday night of a web.com tour event. And, uh, you know, the pin positions aren't quite as, as challenging. And you've got to make a lot of birdies on the web.com tour. You've got to play aggressive. Uh, cuts most weeks range between two and five under par, whereas on the PGA Tour, they can be, you know, two over to two under. And uh, it, it's different styles of game. Uh, obviously, we've we've had a lot, a lot of success stories of guys from the web.com tour come to the PGA tour, but for a majority of guys, it, it's tough that first time on, you know, they don't, you don't keep your card, your first crack at it, or even your second crack at it because you have to learn a different style of golf game. You have to learn different golf courses. You have to learn to be a bit more conservative and understand that par is always a good score and you don't have to make eight birdies around to keep up. And, uh, and so as far as that goes, you know, it's different, but, uh, once you're able to recognize that and kind of, uh, you know, figure things out from there. You can play on the PGA Tour for a while. I mean, they always say it's extremely difficult to get to the PGA Tour, but it's even harder to stay on the PGA Tour. I mean, that's just how good the guys are, and you've got guys coming in from all around the world that are really good at this game, and you've got to play even better if you want to keep your job. And in 2010, when you were out there at the, you know, it was a solid year for a rookie campaign, but the end of your campaign was interesting to say the least. I believe in the last event at the Children's Miracle Network, you were playing to keep your full status for that next season, and you were right in the mix for playing for the Kodak Million Dollar Challenge, which essentially was a million dollar bonus for a year long competition. Um, what, what was that tournament week like, and what was more pressure uh, going for the to keep your card or for that million dollar first prize? Yeah, that was quite the interesting Sunday, that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, I think I went into the week sending 121st or 123rd on the, on the money list and top 125 keeps your card. And I'd made the cut, which I thought that was all that I was going to have to do to keep my card. So I was pretty happy Friday night. I had not birdied the Kodak Cole and both Ricky Fowler and Aaron Badley had, so they tied me. So I knew I had two more chances to, to birdie the Kodak Cole and win it outright, assuming neither one of them hold out for Eagle from the fairway. And that didn't happen, and I didn't make any birdie on it. So that ended up going to a playoff um, Sunday afternoon after the round. But, you know, that Sunday I played solid. I shot a bogey-free 67, 500 par, moved up the leaderboard a little bit. But I still would have lost my card had Johnson Wagner not double bogeyed the 16th hole. He was in the top three. He was trying to win the golf tournament. And had he finished in the top three, he would have finished ahead of me. I would have finished number 126. Uh, as it was, he doubled uh, 16. He finished in the top five, but not quite high enough. He finished number 126. And kudos to him. He went on to win the next fall down at Mayakoba, so it worked out just fine for him. And then, uh, yeah, so I, I was very excited, very stressed out about uh, waiting and just watching and having 
uh, no control over whether or not I was going to finish 125 or 126. And it ended up working out in my favor that time. And, and then I had to go play for a million dollar playoff, you know, for the Kodak challenge. So I, I honestly, you know, all the stress was off. I wasn't, uh, uh, too worried about playing that playoff with Ricky and Aaron. And as it was, I went out there and I, and I stiffed a pitch and wedge into about a foot and a half and I birdied the first playoff hole and, and took home that million dollar prize. And it was just a, a pretty cool, a pretty cool ending to a great day. Did you buy yourself something cool, at least with the million dollar portion of the million dollar first prize? I mean, you got to reward yourself something to get through that gauntlet that day and show some pretty good pressure playing. You know, um, both my wife and I are pretty frugal people. Uh, we put it in the bank after we had given my caddy a percentage and you know, actually gave uh, my agent a percentage of it. Um, you just kind of shared it because it was a, it was a team effort, you know, getting through that year, uh, not just the Kodak challenge, but just everything that goes with, uh, with being on the PGA tour. And uh, a year later, you know, in later of 2011, I bought my wife, um, uh, Lexus RX 350, and we had it for several years. We actually just sold it here last fall because it's it's it just wasn't the right car for us. And you know it was uh, it, you know it was cool at the time, um, but we we've gotten something else that we uh, we both really enjoy, and and that kind of actually feels like the Kodak Challenge win plus having kept my card for so long and still being around on the PGA Tour. So uh, we we bought a truck and. And we're both more excited with that than we were uh, after I won the Kodak Challenge. Well, let's talk about your win that you had in 2015. And if I'm not mistaken, you missed five cuts in a row going into that event. And it shows just what a fine line it is out there. It, what did you sort of find that week from what was going on to going from that to winning? Yeah, it seems like all my good finishes come after missing, you know, four, five, six, seven cuts in a row. It's, it's kind of the trend through my career. And I hope to buck that trend, but uh, we were working hard that week uh, in, in outside of D.C., and I told my caddy at the time, you know, everything feels real good. The game feels solid, but, you know, I hit the shot, I look up, and it's tending to, you know, veer off to the right. Not go, you know, not a big fade, but just comes off straight right, and I miss a lot of shots right. So we noticed that, you know, if I, uh, when I address the ball, if I if I move my hands forward, you know, a quarter of an inch, it gave me just that little bit of extra time at the top of my swing uh, to basically get the club in the right position. And at, at impact, it was where it needed to be. And as a result, I had a lot of quality tee shots and iron shots that week. I think I led the field in strokes gained from tee to green, which never happens. And, um, you know, as I mean, that's all it was. I moved my hands forward a quarter of an inch, and it worked out that week. I made a lot of good putts, uh, set the course record there that week and then ended up setting the tournament record. But it's just one of those things with the game of golf where, you know, you can be playing solid, and there's just that one tiny little thing that will get you over the top. And for me that week, it was just, you know, moving my hands forward a quarter of an inch at a dress. What do you take away from a Sunday like that? Because you played great. You shoot 67, but you got Ricky Fowler, you know, breathing down at you. you the tournament host is Tiger Woods. Him and Jack are by far the greatest ever, like, it's got to be a heck of a feeling to perform for all the marbles on a Sunday in those circumstances and, and, you know, and win. It has to be a wonderful feeling. Yeah. yeah. And you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I drew back on my entire life's um, experiences. I've won a lot of golf tournaments in my life. I had never won on the PGA tour, but I had won a lot. And, and what I, you know, had learned through all those wins is, uh, you know, you, you got to keep your foot on the pedal. Doesn't mean you have to play super aggressive and take a lot of risk, but you have to make good aggressive golf swings to get the ball in the fairway, to put the ball on the green in the proper spot, and to make a few birdies. And if you miss them, have tap in pars. Have a lot of stress free pars and don't have to work to save par and don't make mistakes. Make those guys come and get you. And, you know, it was no different on the PJ Tour. It worked out well that day. I was able to fend off. Uh, a lot of really great golfers, and like you said, uh, was able to fend off Ricky towards the end there. He made a couple late birdies to get back into it, and I kind of laughed with his uh, with his caddy, Joe, whom I know well as well, after the round. I said, you know what? If you guys are at the top of the leaderboard and I'm at the top of the leaderboard, I'm your kryptonite. I go ahead and beat you whenever I have that opportunity. I just don't ever get that opportunity. And we both had a pretty good laugh about that. But, uh, yeah, like I said, it was it was – 
it was a great afternoon. It, it was another great learning experience, and it gave me the confidence to know that if I'm in that situation, I'm going to perform well, you know, and, and I and I can do what I need to do to try to win the golf tournament. Is it always going to work out? Absolutely not. But, uh, you know, if it can work out more often than not, I think it would be a pretty good career. Is there a moment that you had with Tiger when the event's over of just that whole experience of winning Tiger's event and spending some time with him, and I'm sure he had the nicest words for you, that's, that's got to be a pretty cool experience it's, it, on its own as well. You know, uh, I didn't see Tiger after, uh, after I had won uh, that day. He had already uh, left for the day. Uh, I didn't see him until the PGA Championship two weeks later. I talked to him on the driving range a little bit. And, you know, the only uh, real thing that he had to say was he was just unbelievably impressed with the 61 that I shot on Saturday. Uh, he had shot 75, and, I mean, it was a hard golf course. There wasn't a 61 on that golf course, and I just somehow happened to find one. So we talked about that a little bit. But, uh, yeah, it was, yeah I, was, I was excited to see him after the round, but uh, he had some other things to, to get accomplished, and, and I didn't get that chance. Is there a, a level of respect that you then get, or is there, is there like a, for lack of a better word, are you in the fraternity, for lack of a better word, when you actually win on the PGA Tour? Do the other players view you? once you get over that hurdle a little bit different? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, uh, they are you know, very congratulatory. They, they all know how hard it is to win on the PJ Tour, um, you know, from guys that have actually won to guys that have not won. Um, but also, you know, knowing the fact that, yeah, you, you've won one time, but, you know, the big thing, you know, the challenge that I've had since that win is to validate it. You know, it's, it's nice to win on the PGA Tour, but, you know, anybody can get hot for four days and, and win on the PGA Tour. And, and I don't want to be that guy that's just a one-hit wonder. You know, I'd like to win several more times out here. And and once you get winning, you know, two, three, four, five times, you know, guys start to recognize that, yeah, you know, absolutely. He, you know, he can win multiple times out here. And, uh and, and, and that's when you, you, you know, you get to a different level of respect and, and that's my goal now. You know, it's, it's nice to have won one time, but I need to win a few more times, you know, just to prove to myself too, that, that I still belong out there, that I can still win out there. And, and, and that's the, that's the next step for me. Well, the last few questions I have for you are just more on the lighter side. So whatever sort of hits your brain on these, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, my, my first question is, are you a golf fan, and did you watch the Masters over the weekend? I know some guys don't like watching golf when they're off. Some guys do. Did you watch it, and what's your thoughts of it, and are you good friends with uh, with Patrick Reed at all? Uh, I am a golf fan. I, I, I will say that typically if I'm not playing an event that week, I, I probably won't be watching the PGA Tour that week. I, I will watch it when I'm on the road when I'm playing in the event. Uh, I actually quite enjoy watching the European Tour and the LPGA Tour. You know, it, it's uh, it players, uh, men and women that I don't see ever on golf courses that I never get to play, and I and I quite wa- like watching how they go about their business. And you know, and I try to learn from them as well. As far as the Masters, I was down there. I got in Friday night. I was there on Saturday. I decided not to go out to the tournament. I was tired of getting wet. Uh, from Sunday at the Dominican Republic, we got absolutely drenched, and I didn't want to go out and get wet. So I um, I stayed inside. I, I watched the coverage all day, and I really enjoyed it. I mean, I'm just like everybody else, I l- absolutely love the Masters. Uh, I love it even more when I'm playing in it versus watching it. Uh, I thought it was an outstanding event. It had, especially Sunday, it was such a great Sunday. You know, nobody went out there and lost that golf tournament. They all competed very hard, and Patrick Reed won the golf tournament. It wasn't handed to him. It wasn't given to him. He won that golf tournament. Uh, I, I can't say that I'm, I'm good friends with Patrick Reed. Uh, you know, I say hi, I've played with him several times. You know, he, he always says hi, you know, we'll have a little chat from time to time, but you know, to say that we're best friends is, you know, like you definitely can't go that far. Um, I, I think he's a great guy. I think he's a good person. He's a hell of a competitor and, uh, and he is good for the game of golf. Yeah. They, that golf course with that back nine on a Sunday, it's, it's, it's got to be the best nine holes of golf of somebody can shoot 30 and somebody can shoot 40. And the margin of that is so minuscule. It makes it so exciting as a golf fan to watch. It's, it's always interesting to say the least. So it's good stuff. Um, my next question, if you could take three PGA tour players, go out and have a fun money game, 
have a couple of dinner, uh, drinks, some dinner afterwards. Which three guys are you taking to make your foursome, and what do you admire most about those guys? Oh, you know, I'd like to play with uh, some buddies. So I, I think uh, I'd probably take uh, my buddy Straub, uh, Cheston Hadley, and Bryce Garnett. It would be a very uh, relaxed uh, round of golf. There would be a lot of banter. Uh, we'd be making fun of each other. Uh, probably, you know, be a couple of drinks consumed. And, uh, you know, nobody w- would want to lose. And uh, it, it would be a great time. They're all three, very, uh, you know, great guys. All have won on the PGA Tour now. And, uh, you know, and they've all struggled in their careers. You know, we've all come up from the Web.com Tour. Uh, we're all, we've all uh, come from, you know, basically nowhere, no names to being PGA Tour winners. And, uh, you know, they're great guys. We all have a lot of fun. And uh, I think that'd be a pretty good time. Best golf shot you ever hit under pressure? Ooh, uh, you know, I, I think I could, uh, you know, I think uh, that, that eight iron I hit on 16 at the Quicken Loans on Sunday uh, that got in there at about three feet, that was a pretty good shot. But I would say that uh, on the next hole, 17, when I hit it about six inches over the green and I, I, I bellied a, uh, a lob wedge and I hit it about six inches and it trickled all the way down right next to the hole and I saved par, that's probably you know, the best shot that I've ever hit in tournament golf. And it only went, you know, I hit it six inches and it ended up next to the hole. Best golf shot you ever saw a competitor hit in a tour event while you were playing with them, where you were just blown away, didn't see the shot, didn't have it in your imagination. And were just in awe of what that player did. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I'll say it was back to back shots, the best back to back, most pure two shots I've ever seen in my life were Nick Watney, at the Safeway Open in Napa on the 18th hole into the wind, uh, absolutely killed the drive. Uh, you know, I've never heard a sound like that. And then flushed a three wood uh, into the wind from you know 275, landed on the front, rolled all the way up, hit the middle of the stick, and it didn't go in. But he tapped in for eagle. But the two most pure golf shots I've ever seen in my life. Who had the most raw natural talent uh, in the game of golf that you ever had the opportunity to play with? Uh, I saw it uh, Saturday, my rookie year at the Players Championship at TPC Sawgrass. I was, put, I was paired with Phil Mickelson, and he played great golf that day. And uh, uh, he hit a, a five iron from 215 into the wind on number 11 to a front left pin that almost touched the clouds. Ended up about eight feet from the hole, and I, and I just looked at my caddy and I said, "I don't have that shot." Wow, that's that's pretty cool. Um three or four most interesting people you had a chance to meet, not necessarily golfers, but because of the game of golf. Ooh, interesting. Uh, you know, uh, I would have to say Detlef Shrimp, uh, who played for the Sonics and the Blazers. Yeah. And yeah. actually did, I actually did meet him on the golf course, but uh, not a golfer. Uh, I had the chance to play with Sean Drover, uh, the drummer uh, used to be for Megadeth, but now with Active Defiance. I never thought I would play with a, a heavy metal drummer and a great guy, you know, you know, one of the nicest guys I've met. And uh, besides that, uh, you know what? I actually didn't meet him. I accidentally blew him off, and I didn't know it. But uh, uh, the older President Bush used to sit off the eighth green on Sunday at Houston, and all the players would shake his hand as they walk to the ninth tee box. And I didn't know that, and I blew right past him. So I missed that opportunity to meet uh, President Bush. To meet 41. Ooh, that would, yeah, that would be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, right? That that would be a one heck of an experience. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty good list. My last question I have for you, architecturally, what's the three best golf courses in the world that you've ever had the chance to play? It doesn't necessarily be a tour course, but just the three best golf courses you've ever had a chance to play in your career? Uh, Old Course, St. Andrews, Carnoustie, and Augusta National. What makes them, if you can kind of go through it, what makes them all, they're a little bit different, but what makes each of them so special architecturally, in your opinion? They are giant uh, puzzles that will never be solved, as I spoke of earlier, and they are three golf courses that I can play every day, find enjoyment every day, and play the golf course different every day. Yeah, that's that's the sign of a great golf course, isn't it? Where imagination can be used, and you could picture yourself in the next twenty years never playing the same course twice per se because of conditions and and whatnot. That's it's a pretty good list. 
Mm-hmm. Well, yep. I, I would like to thank you so much for, for taking your time today to be on the podcast. Wonderful insights, and I greatly, greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. That was a lot of fun. I appreciate it as well.